Okay, thus far we have only gone over how to send Ether from one account to another. But the real value proposition of using something like Ethereum over Bitcoin is the ability to deploy arbitrary computation onto the network in the form of smart contracts. And there's a lot of information to digest regarding smart contracts, so we're just going to dive right into it and start unpacking the methodology as we go. So smart contracts are ultimately just a series of Ethereum virtual machine op codes as defined in the Ethereum yellow paper. And this looks something similar to Java bytecode or assembly or what have you. But it is impossible for most developers to actually program in a language that's this low level. So instead we use various higher level programming languages to write our smart contracts in and then use compilers to compile that code down into these opcodes for us. Right now, the most popular language for writing smart contracts is a language called Solidity. And Solidity looks something like Java or any run-of-the-mill statically typed object-oriented language. And there's a standalone Solidity compiler written in C++ that can take Solidity code and compile it down into EVM bytecode. But this compiler is a complete bitch to actually install. So we are not going to mess around with that right now. Instead, we are going to use the JavaScript implementation of the Solidity compiler, which works perfectly well compiling Solidity code into EVM bytecode just as long as it is running in a JavaScript runtime. And seeing as the node console that we've been using thus far is using JavaScript, that should work just fine. So like we've been doing before, we are going to make a new directory called contracts, and I'm going to then CD into that directory. And as we've been doing before, we are going to create a new file called package.json. And as we've been doing, we will use the Web3 library, but now we are also going to use the SolC library, short for Solidity Compiler version 0.4.4. And I will then npm install that. And once that's done, let me start a new tmux session. Dash n contracts, um, and I will start my test RBC in the bottom, and I will start my node console on the top, and I will set var web three equal to require web three, and then I will create an instance of web three hooked up to the test RBC, and now I will set a var soul c equal to require soul c, and once that is loaded, we are good to go. So I'm going to create a new smart contract and open it in Atom, and it's going to be called hello world.sol. .sol is the file extension for the Solidity programming language. And I can define a new contract by writing the words contract and the name of the contract, which in this case is hello world, and then curly braces. And I'm going to define a function on that contract called display message. Um, and then I'm going to write constant returns string and inside this function, I'm going to just return the string hello from a smart contract and then put a semicolon. And don't worry too much about what this syntax actually does right now. Just trust me that this is a valid smart contract that will display a string when this function is called. And now if I go back to my node console right here, I'm actually going to copy this out of my text editor. I'm going to find a new variable called source. And then I'm going to paste in the contract syntax here. And that uh, grave tick right there is just a way to define a string in ESX JavaScript. And then I can compile that contract into bytecode. And I'm going to save that as a variable called compiled by using solc.compile and then passing in the source string. So if the Solidity compiler is correctly installed, that should work. And if I inspect that, compiled object, you could see we have quite a bit of information here to unpack. So let me make some more room for us. And I'm going to go into that compile.contracts.hello world object that it gives us. And this will be information about that hello world contract. And the first thing I'm going to look at is the dot bytecode. And you can see this is actual Ethereum bytecode or EVM bytecode for that smart contract. And when we deploy this contract to the Ethereum network, this bytecode is what we are actually deploying. Now we could actually look at the opcodes by doing hello world.opcodes. 
And that gives us a display of the Ethereum opcodes. And you may note that this is a one-to-one -one mapping to this. So if you go back to that link that I had open, where you could look at individual opcodes and their corresponding bytecode value, you could see that this last term in the opcodes jump corresponds to 56 in bytes. And we can see that the last term of the bytecode is 56. So this is an actual mapping here, which may or may not be interesting for you if you want to learn more about how the EVM actually works. But we can see the opcodes that this contract compiled down to. The other thing that's going to be interesting to look at is if we do compiled.contracts.helloworld.interface. And this is something called an ABI, which defines the public-facing interface of your contract so that users of this contract know how to call into it and what methods are available to them. So when we actually create a contract object through the Web3 object, we're going to need this ABI. So I'm going to set a variable called ABI, and I actually don't want the string representation of this. I want this as the JavaScript data structure, so I'm going to parse this to get a data structure that looks like this. So now I have the public interface or ABI of this contract saved in a data structure, and I'm going to instantiate a new variable called hello world contract. And I'm going to set that equal to web3.f.contract and then pass in the ABI. So now I have this hello world contract object, and I'm going to use this to deploy that contract to our test RPC. So in order to deploy this contract, I'm going to set a variable called deployed equal to the hello world contract dot new. And I'm going to pass this a JavaScript object as an argument. And this is going to take a from parameter, which is the account that we want to deploy it from. And we're just going to use the default web3.f that accounts zero. And then we're going to need to pass in the data parameter, which is the actual bytecode of the contract that we want to deploy. So in this case, that's going to be compiled.contracts.helloworld.bytecode. And then we're going to need to pass the gas that we want to send with the transaction. And this raises the question of how much gas are we actually going to need? How do we, how do we figure that out? Depending on how big and lengthy your contract is, there's going to be various amounts of gas required to deploy it. So a really helpful tool that exists in order to help you out with this is the Solidity Online Compiler. This is a site on ethereum.github.io slash browser dash Solidity that allows you to paste in Solidity contracts and it'll give you an estimation of how much gas that it's going to cost to actually deploy it. In this case, it's estimating that this contract of Hello World takes 4.7 million gas. I'm just going to copy that number in right here. And then we need to set a gas price, but because we're using our local test RPC, this doesn't actually matter. So I'm just going to type in five here. And then that's all that you need to do. And then this is going to take a second parameter, this hello world contract.new, which is a callback function, which takes two arguments, the error and the contract. So if it is successful in deploying the contract, it'll return to us a contract object. If it errors out when trying to deploy the contract, it'll return an error object. I'm just going to leave this blank for now because we're not going to do anything with it. We're just going to hit enter and hope that it works. So we actually see down in our test RBC that this did go through and there's a transaction ID. And interestingly, there's a contract address as well. And this raises an interesting point about Ethereum is that contracts actually have their own addresses the same way that regular Ethereum accounts have their own addresses as well. So there's two kinds of Ethereum addresses, um, personal Ethereum accounts and contract addresses. And that's going to be important later on. But we can go ahead and inspect this transaction ID the way that we have done this before with web3.f.getTransaction and pass in the transaction ID and see that the input is the actual bytecode of the transaction and everything else looks exactly like we would expect. And now this deployed object that's returned from the contract creation call is actually a reference to the deployed contract on the network. So if I did deployed.address, we'll see that what it returns is actually the address of the contract. And if for some reason we didn't capture that deployed object when it came back, we can always instantiate a new reference to it by doing hello world contract dot at and then passing in the address to that. And that'll give us a new reference to the deployed contract.
Now, once we have a reference to the deployed contract, we can call actual functions on it that are publicly exposed. In this case, we had a function called display message, and we can call it by doing display message dot call. And we'll see that this comes back hello from a smart contract. So this was a, a very simple example of deploying a function to the test net and calling a method on it. Now, just to go back to this for a second, we saw that this function display message has this constant little parameter before the returns string. And this constant is just saying that this is a function that will not modify state on the Ethereum network in any way. No matter how many times I call this function, it'll always return hello from a smart contract and everyone else's contracts won't be affected at all. So if you have a constant return, you can put this little constant parameter here and that means that Ethereum can just return it to you in real time without having to actually query the network and it can cache it locally so that it's a really fast call. So that's a very simple example of a smart contract. Let's do something slightly more complex now.